Welcome to our presentation on COVID-19, the role of nutrition. This presentation will be presented by Susie Cohen, Maria Mahak, Daniela Nassim, and Armando Olivas, current dietetic interns at Larkin Community Hospital. Signs and symptoms for coronavirus may appear between 2 and 14 days after exposure. These symptoms include fever, cough, shortness of breath, persistent pain or pressure in the chest, new confusion or inability to arouse, and bluish lips or face. There is currently no vaccine to prevent COVID-19. The best way to prevent it is to avoid being exposed to the virus by following these recommendations. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay at home if you are sick. Clean and disinfect frequently touch objects and surfaces. Wash your hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. If soap and water are not available, use hand sanitizer. Cover your cough or sneeze with a tissue and then throw it. These tables are from an article published by the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and they stratify the number of confirmed cases of COVID-19 and their respective fatality rate in mainland China as of February 11, 2020, according to a number of characteristics. So if you look at the table on the left, in red I have boxed in the fatality rate according to age. As you can see, it is the elderly population who is most at risk for dying from disinfection. Now, looking at the table on the right, in red I have boxed in the fatality rate according to comorbid condition. As you can see, those with existing comorbidities suffer from a higher fatality rate compared to those without a comorbidity. And what should be noted is that proper nutrition is fundamental in preventing and or managing many of these comorbid conditions. For example, we know obesity is associated with a higher risk for hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and many types of cancers. This highlights the potential that nutrition may have in reducing COVID-19 associated deaths. To feed a patient with coronavirus in the ICU, the registered dietitian should keep in mind these important goals. Meet basic nutritional requirements. Maintain stable weight. Facilitate weaning from mechanical ventilation. Provide adequate but no excessive calories. And avoid under or overfeeding. So why is nutrition important during respiratory failure? Nutrition is vital once patients are infected and hospitalized. Diaphragm and intercostal muscle strength affects air movement into our lungs. And without adequate nutrition during this very catabolic state, muscle strength decreases, negatively impacting our breathing. Therefore, nutrition in ventilated patients should begin rapidly and as soon as possible. Severe coronavirus patients will require intubation and ventilation. In these cases, enteral nutrition, while maintaining aspiration precautions since they are ventilated, is preferred. Parental nutrition, only a last resort. Enteral feeding preserves gut mucosa, decreases infections by stimulating gut-associated lymphoid tissue, which then produces immunoglobulin A to help ward off pathogens, and prevents intestinal permeability, blocking invaders from being able to enter the bloodstream. However, if gut issues or intolerances arise, trophic feeds, or feeding formula at low rates, are enough to stimulate the gut and prevent permeability. Providing the correct amounts of nutrition is important. Underfeeding ventilated patients may diminish muscle strength and, therefore, capacity to wean from the ventilator, in addition to lead to poor wound healing. Research shows that having a calorie debt during ventilation increases length of stay, infection, mortality, and ventilation days. Overfeeding may increase lipogenesis, hyperglycemia, liver dysfunction, and exacerbate weaning too. Why? Because when we overfeed, we produce more CO2. An increased CO2 increases respiratory rate in order to maintain a normal blood pH, but a person cannot spontaneously breathe with an increased respiratory rate. In regards to estimating needs, 
Although indirect calorimetry is the gold standard, when not available, the Penn State equation is recommended to estimate energy needs. Protein should be between 1.2 to 2 grams per kilogram of body weight. In obese individuals, hypocaloric feedings with increased protein are recommended in order to prevent hyperglycemia and hypercapnia. Although we just talked about nutrition in the ICU setting, so when a patient already has coronavirus, it is important to mention that nutrition may also play a role in boosting and supporting our immune system. This is in no way saying that through nutrition you can completely prevent or cure coronavirus. However, the literature does support various nutrients as being boosters of our immune system, which help it work positively in our benefit. We should always be eating varied diets focused on fruits and vegetables and other nutritious foods all the time, not just when there is a disease spreading. But during this time, it is important to keep in mind that nutritious foods and certain nutrients, as we will now see, can help our immune system work a little better and keep us overall healthier. The role of nutrition in preventing infectious disease begins at the earliest stages of life. Research shows human breast milk confers a plethora of benefits to the receiving infant. Many of these benefits are shown on the graphic to the right. Specific to infectious disease, research shows infants fed human breast milk are at less risk for respiratory tract infections, infections of the GI tract, and acute ear infections. The CDC reports that the presence of COVID-19 has not been identified in human breast milk samples collected from mothers who tested positive for COVID-19. However, it remains unknown whether COVID-19 can be transmitted to an infant via breast milk. The CDC recommends that the decision to breastfeed should be taken by the mother in coordination with the family and healthcare team. If deciding to breastfeed, a face mask should be utilized and all hygienic precautions such as proper hand washing should be taken before and while making contact with the infant in order to reduce risk of transmission. Research has identified multiple mechanisms through which human breast milk elicits its immune modulating function. Unique components of human breast milk are believed to function as enzymes, chemokines, antioxidants, antimicrobial and anti-inflammatory agents, growth factors, and probiotics and prebiotics. Much research has centered around human milk oligosaccharides or HMOs. HMOs are complex carbohydrates that are unique to human breast milk. HMOs can boost an infant's immune system through multiple mechanisms of action. These are shown in greater detail on the graphic to the right. To summarize a couple of key mechanisms, the structure of HMO strongly resembles the structure of cell surface receptors of the gastrointestinal epithelial lining. Thus, HMOs are capable of acting as decoy receptor sites for pathogenic bacteria and viruses. HMOs can also function as prebiotics and can help the host establish a beneficial microbiota. Finally, HMOs have been shown to promote the growth of short-chain fatty acid-producing bifidobacterium, which can help lower gut pH and improve gut barrier function. Now we will discuss several vitamins and minerals demonstrated by research to play an essential role in supporting our immune system. We will briefly discuss their role in modulating the immune response and identify food sources of these vitamins and minerals. The first one we will discuss is vitamin D. Research shows our immune cells have vitamin D receptors indicating that vitamin D has a direct influence in modulating their function. Vitamin D has been shown to stimulate immune cell production, phagocytosis, and antimicrobial response. Research shows vitamin D can also reduce inflammatory cytokine activity. Some sources of vitamin D include egg yolks, fatty fish such as salmon, trout, or sardines, mushrooms, fortified milk, fortified cereal, and sunlight. Zinc is another important nutrient that needs to be taken into consideration when it comes to boosting our immune system. Deficiency negatively impacts immune cells. Zinc increases immunity after impairment. It also decreases mortality from infectious diseases and decreases inflammation. Good sources of zinc are seafood, poultry, red meat, nuts, pumpkin seeds, and whole grains. Vitamin C. It increases phagocytosis, increases microbial killing, increases collagen synthesis, and proliferation of immune cells, and decreases the respiratory and systemic infections. Good sources of vitamin Cs are strawberries, kiwi, cauliflower, citrus fruit, bell pepper, cantaloupe, tomato, and guava. 
Omega-3 fatty acids, they increase anti-inflammatory cytokines, decrease lymphocytes and CD4 proliferation. They suppress T cells. They, sh they have been shown to have a protective effect on in asthma and autoimmune disorders. Good sources of omega-3 are fatty fish, like salmon, herring, mackerel, anchovies, and sardines, and marine algae. Probiotics, they interact with gut muco mucosa. They increase immune tolerance, which means they help repair damage in intestinal barrier and are also unaffected by antibiotics. They increase pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines, support epithelial cells. For lactobacilli, they in increases the IgA resistance to infection, prevent autoimmune response, and lactobacillus in general reduce duration of respiratory and GI infections. Good sources are fermented foods like kombucha, tempeh, sauerkraut, kimchi, and yogurt. Selenium has antioxidant properties, which means that it protects cells from damage, plays a key role in metabolism, deficiency increases the rate at which some viruses can mutate. The good sources are brazil nuts, fish, sunflower seeds, poultry, and whole grains. Lastly, here are our references for our presentation. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you learned a lot and that you found this presentation informative on the role of nutrition for treating coronavirus patients.